Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, we're going to get started here. It looks like we've got our kind of final people trickling in. Um, and we are doing our live broadcast. I'm going to ask you if you're coming in and you're not uh, automatically muted, please just uh, mute yourself so that uh, everybody is able to hear what's going on as we progress through this meeting. Uh, welcome uh, to this event, uh, a meat sector that works for Nebraska's uh, processors, producers, and customers. Uh, tonight we're going to be discussing um, chiefly, um, we're going to kind of give a broad picture of the state of uh, local meat processing here in Nebraska, and in particular as it relates to uh, a bill that's coming before the legislature uh, now, LB 324, which will amend the state's meat and poultry inspection. Um, and, you know, I know that many of the people on this call are uh, somehow involved in the industry, um, whether you're a producer or processor or just a buyer. Um, so some of this will be familiar to you, but just to set the stage. Sweetheart, uh, sweetheart. Oh, sorry, could we get you to yourself there, Lynn? Um, uh, just to set the stage, we, um, last year, you know, uh, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, there were these plant closures at the big meat packing plants. And uh, because that industry is so consolidated and uh, just a small number of plants process such a great number of animals, uh, even a few closures resulted in a massive backlog of meat animals that were ready to slaughter and, uh, and to be butchered and go to market. And as a result, uh, there was a lot of money lost on both ends. There were, uh, you know, many, thousands and thousands of animals who had to be euthanized um, because they couldn't just sit there and be a drain on the resources of a farmer. Um, and producers started looking for other routes to get their meat processed and out to market. And so what you saw instead was that uh, meat lockers and smaller plants were flooded with this massive amount of product that uh, you know they weren't used to or they weren't quite prepared for. Um, and so what that amounts to is a continued even now bottleneck. And um, a lot of these smaller lockers here in Nebraska and in surrounding states are booked out until late 2022 with orders. Um, and so what that means is uh, for the producer, it's, it's hard to plan in 2022, the animal that you're trying to get slaughtered may not even be born yet. Um, and so it makes it hard to plan and it, and it may also lead to lost revenue and not being able to get your animals to market. And, and that's a situation of uncertainty and uh, um, financial difficulty that could cause people to get out of the industry. Um, and so what we have here is a challenge and also sort of an opportunity because you have uh, this great quantity of animals and a great demand for uh, local meat. And in between you have the space of processors and what we have to, do is to figure out a way to get those animals to where they can uh, be on somebody's dinner table. Um, and so in looking for solutions to that and how to expand local processing and promote that local food system that can work better for the farmer, work better for the processor and give the customer access to uh, local meat at a good price. Um, we've kind of gathered together people from all different corners of uh, this question, people who are stakeholders in this question uh, tonight to discuss it. And so, uh, first of all, we've got Senator Tom Brandt who introduced this bill, uh, LB 324 in the legislature, um, and uh, who is also a producer himself, and we'll speak to that bill. Um, we've also got Paula, Peter Paula Peterson of Tom Peterson Farms outside of Waverly. She's currently uh, driving some calves to Wahoo right now, um, and she's gonna speak sort of from a producer perspective. Um, and then we've got Brian O'Malley, who is the Associate Dean for Culinary Arts, Hospitality and Horticulture at Metropolitan Community College. And he'll speak sort of from that um, food systems, local food systems angle um, as well. Uh, later on, we hope to also have join us Brent Winfield, who is a processor out of Aurora, um, a custom processor at the Aurora Meat Block and uh, a member of the board of the State Processors Association. He's uh, in a reflection of how busy the processors are right now, he's uh, uh, still closing up the shop, but hopes to join us uh, later on in the meeting. And so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Senator Brandt first to uh, talk about the bill and, and the issue uh, before us. 
Well, thank you, Nathan. Thank you for the Center for Rural Affairs for having me this evening. Uh, I hope everybody got dug out, got the bumps cleaned out, got the cattle bedded. Uh, I know if you're calving right now, it's, it's a really tough time. Uh, here in Lincoln, we've had about 15 inches in the last day and a half. It's, it's not too bad on the main streets, but you get on the side streets, it gets pretty tough. For those of you that don't know who I am, uh, I'm a farmer and a livestock uh, feeder from Plymouth. Uh, Plymouth is south of Lincoln, about 50 miles. Um, we generally feed out about 130 head of, of steers and heifers. Uh, we've got, between my son and myself, about 40 to 45 head of cows. And we used to feed out about 1,500 head of hogs in the hoop buildings. Uh, but because of their condition in the market and losing our feeder pig source, uh, I think this was the last year uh, that we've done that. I graduated from the university in 1982. And uh, upon graduation, I worked the next eight years in meat packing. I was an engineer for Lewis Rich and Oscar Meyer, an industrial engineer. And then I moved to IVP and worked in industrial engineering and project engineering. Um, so I've got a pretty good background. I could probably still build a meat packing plant. Uh, the last project we had was Lexington and I was responsible for half the design on that, on that plant. Came home to the farm in 1990 and we've been there ever since. Uh, currently in the legislature, I've started my third year. Uh, I serve on three committees. I just got reelected as vice chairman of the Ag Committee. Uh, I'm also the only active farmer on the Ag Committee. I serve on general affairs. Uh, for those of you that don't know what general affairs is liquor, cigarettes, gambling, cemeteries and libraries. And uh, this last meeting was the first time in three years we did anything on cemeteries and libraries. And the, the committee that takes most of my time is judiciary. Today, we heard nine bills on tenant landlord law. Uh, the judiciary committee hears by far the most bills in the legislature. We have 150 bills we have to get through uh, in the next uh, six weeks. So we've got a pretty full slate down here. So let's talk about 324. It's the herd share law. And the reason it's called herd share is in Wyoming last year, Representative Lindholm who's a farmer slash rancher from up at Sundance, Wyoming, um, sort of an independent guy, sort of a fun guy to talk to, uh, looked at what Wyoming could do to help with the backup on the COVID of livestock. And he studied the uh, Federal Meat Inspection Code, the FSIS manuals, and in there, there is one paragraph in federal meat inspection, paragraph 623. And it is one sentence. And it basically says that the owner of the livestock can kill and consume the livestock. And that's all that sentence says. So it's like what we've been doing in Nebraska for 150 years. Our friends and neighbors get together, they kill five or six hogs or a couple steers. And right now in Nebraska, yeah, that's sort of legal. Uh, if you sell it to anybody, it's sort of not, but there really isn't any state meat inspection or, or inspectors to enforce that. And I talked to him about that. And what this is, it has nothing to do with the state. What they did is they sold shares of your herd. So for $1, I can make up a document and we're gonna have uh, examples of that when we present the bill next week. Uh, but basically, uh, if I was interested in, in doing this, uh, you, would, you would become a herd share owner of Tom Brandt's feedlot. And I could sell any number of these for any amount of money, but generally in Wyoming, they did it for a dollar or $10. And you had to sell the share before an animal is killed. So you really need, in dealing with the customer, two pieces of paper. You need a signed piece of paper that says they are a herd share owner. Then that animal is slaughtered and processed. Uh, because of that regulation in the code, it does not have to go to a locker plant. It probably will in a lot of situations because I don't slaughter. If I were to participate, I would try and get Pickerel or Diller or one of my locker plants to do it and then bring all the uh, pieces back to my farm and put them into my freezers. I would call up 
all of my herd share owners, let's say I had 20 herd share owners and I'd say I just slaughtered a steer and the parts are here and they would text me back or call me back and, and one individual may want T-bones, the next one may want roast, the next one may want ground beef, the next one may want the oxtail. And I can price that accordingly and I can sell just the parts that they want to buy to them for whatever the market rate is. And I can determine that. Now comes a second piece of paper. When they purchase that, I give them a piece of paper that says, this is custom exempt. You were a herd share owner of, of Tom Brandt Farms and you cannot resell this meat. You can't, they can't take it to the cafe and sell it. They can't take it to the school and sell it. It's just like what we do under custom exempt. Um, when you have your meat slaughtered at the local locker, it'll say custom exempt and it'll have your name on it. Um, that would Tom, you went into mute. I don't know what happened. Okay, so are we back on the air? Can you hear me now? Yep, we're good. Sorry okay. about that. How far did I get? Uh, you were just out for probably the last five seconds, so. Okay, um, so basically the Wyoming law is wide open and in the Nebraska law, we put in a couple of guardrails. One, we put a limit on the number of livestock that that producer can slaughter in a year's time. So one producer can slaughter 10 cattle, 25 hogs and 50 sheep or goats. We did this uh, sort of as a concession to the lockers um, although I don't think there's going to be a much overlap there. I think the people that already kill on the farm do that already across the state. Um, but I think the lockers will benefit from this also. Um, in the back of the bill, first of all, if you read the bill, section 10 is about this herd share program. We added a section 11. And what section 11 is, is a shell of a program uh, to give grants to our lockers in the state of Nebraska under two and a half million dollars in revenue, under 25 employees. Uh, if we can find a funding source for that, it would give out $100,000 grants for equipment and building. We have not found that funding source yet. Uh, it could happen uh, with some of the CARES money uh, that we have coming into the state of Nebraska. Back to the herd share bill, um, I've been here three years. It's really strange. Senators are really giddy about this. They're really sort of excited about this. And I think a lot of that is it's really pretty simple and it really doesn't involve the state of Nebraska. So we're in discussions with, with Wyoming. Um, they are going through an audit uh, by uh, FSIS right now to make sure they're in compliance. Uh, I talked to Representative Lindholm earlier this week. Um, they've had no incidences or problems in Wyoming. And right now, I think Texas, Arkansas, Nebraska, and either Montana or South Dakota are also pushing legislation of this nature. Uh, the feds do not like it. Uh, because they think it circumvents um, the federal rules, which yes and no. Uh, that paragraph in the federal rules pretty much grants an exemption to owners of the livestock. Um, so that's what that is predicated on. Uh, I am an advocate for state meat inspection, which is something totally different. The Ag Committee this year, we looked at state meat inspection and the state of Nebraska does not want to do that because it costs money. If you just have federal inspection in your state, the feds pay for it. If you have state meat inspection, the people that use it have to pay for it. And we've never been able to figure out how to get enough users to pay for the fees of a state meat inspection. And so then this herd share, it does not create a lot of shackle spaces. Like when the COVID hit, <clears throat> And I have the Smithfield pork plant and we backed up a lot of hogs around Crete, Nebraska or the hogs that went to Crete because they slowed those chain speeds down. 
But where it does help out some of those producers is they could now kill those hogs under this herd share and get rid of some of this meat. So uh, it, it is a way. And it is a way for people that want to start niche marketing of their livestock. So if you have, maybe you have some Berkshire hogs, or maybe you have some uh, Angus cattle, and, and maybe you want to start selling under your own label, this would be an opportunity to start that way. So Nathan, uh, was that a good enough explanation about what herd share is? Yeah, I think it was. I think that that lays out uh, what the idea is, um, broadly speaking. And if you could also um, just give a brief overview of the sort of second piece of the bill, which is maybe uh, equally important, um, uh, I think it'd be good for our audience to hear about the um, processes assistance program and the grants that. Uh, yeah, and that's that. I just touched on that. That is that. Sec that's the last part of the bill. Uh, we set up a shell. Uh, and that's what I was saying. If, if they were under two and a half million dollars on annual sales or under 25 employees is sort of the guide rails that they put in there. It would, it would hand out $100,000 grants. I would guess it would probably be administered by the Department of Economic Development. Uh, I would have to look at it again. Uh, if anybody wants to look this bill up, it is LB324. Go to nebraskalegislature.com up in the right hand corner. It will ask for a number, a bill number. Just type in 324 and then you can go through and you can read the bill for yourself. The first nine sections are existing law in Nebraska. For those of you that have never looked at a, uh, a, a law that's proposed, you're going to see language that's underlined. Underlined is what we are proposing crossed out is what we're proposing to cross out. And the language that is not altered is existing language in the existing bill. So this is attached to the Nebraska's meat inspection, the current, current regulations for meat inspection. Um, so the processor part of this, uh, I think would be really good for rural economic development. You know, that's that next step that we're looking for in the state. And um, we're, we're still looking for funding for that. So we have high hopes. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Senator Brandt. Uh, I think that's a good overview. We have um, Brent uh, Winfield now, who I had mentioned earlier, a processor who's gonna share with us a little bit of his thoughts, uh, his experience uh, this year in this kind of unusual year and, and, and uh, his perspective on this bill as well. So Brent, uh, the floor is yours if you wanna um, say your piece. Okay. Hi guys. Um, so fair warning, we've been so busy. I have never zoomed or anything like that before. Um, so bear with me. Am I doing this right? Can you hear me? Yep. We're all good. Go on ahead. So my wife is actually taking care of the kids and her and I work together in tandem with our business. So we actually kind of pre-wrote this out. So I'm going to read this off. This is just kind of our thoughts on everything. Um, it seems we have the potential to bring change of choice to the people on what is on their plate. During COVID-19, things were more than actually we'd like to describe. We were not broke in a sense of despair, but rather busy in a way that we could not actually help our community. We could purchase box beef from a local federal source to supply the community with the ground beef and other cuts, but it didn't matter how much money we had in our accounts. It didn't matter what was around, the product was just not available for us to get to our customers. We we're unable to fulfill the needs of our community as the laws currently are. As a producer of beef as well, we were beyond words on what I would like to use in public to explain our feelings on how the large packers were able to exploit the situation while my customers and I both were exploited by these large packers. My entire life, I have believed that folks should have a choice and that choice should be exercised with your own judgment. A person should be allowed to make the fiscal decision to invest their income into that choice is what is on their table. If they choose to eat fast food or go out to eat, that's their choice. If they choose to invest in a local livestock producer and choose a local processor they feel comfortable with that they have built a relationship with, they should have that freedom. The book, The Jungle, was written on many things involving the meat industry and dictated our current regulation. 
I would like to see in this troubled nation another state beyond Wyoming look beyond regulations and government overreach and allow people the choice of how they eat at home. The jungle had several points on how large meat facilities were not up to standards of food and employee safety. Times have changed and individuals should choose to invest into producers of livestock as a group or individually, and they should have the choice to take that animal where they feel comfortable to a legal facility and have it harvested. This should be an honored right of freedom. Before my wife and I conclude, I would also like to mention one more thing. Our local economy, in Nebraska especially, is vital to our state survival, economy is. We are a landlocked state that values ourselves on tenacious self-reliant philosophy. It has also been what has kept this state afloat during the winter of 49. The Dust Bowl, what allowed our citizens to volunteer so quickly for both world wars, the sod busting mentality that will not fail, and it is our state's heritage. Therefore, we are a forgotten gem in this nation of high politics right now. We do not require much outside help. We do not require a lot of high media attention and we are self-sufficient. And we have a self-sufficient mindset on our tables should be included because that's what we are. We're a family home-based state. You should have the right to choose where you take your animal. We realize that some issues will arise in legality and wholesome safety of the animal being processed for human consumption. My government teacher in high school and my government professor in college both taught me from very vastly different political views, the government is always about compromise. This is an idea that we propose going forward. The compromise that we have is that it should be for facilities that are legally permitted. Not only would this increase revenues through permitting fees, but it would also require inspection. This would eliminate any garage style chop shops as we actually call them. And it would allow facilities that are already being inspected to flourish. It would also include regulation through state and or federal inspections, mostly because custom exec plants already are federally or state inspected from time to time. We have been asked by other locker owners, why in this time of extreme demand do we want to try a venue of, for extra work? And to be very honest with you guys off the script, we don't. Um, I really don't need the extra work or the extra income. But going back to what we have written here, um, we really believe in freedom and personal choice. Uh, I believe in that more than my own financial gain. I believe in that and more than, um, we just truly believe in freedom of choice. So in conclusion, I hope that this state can join Wyoming in a head-on offensive on a non-agricultural state's agendas, which I mean, if anybody does kind of look at there, there does seem to be at times an agenda against agricultural states. Freedom of embracing states by starting their own foundation for citizens uh, to join into different um, groups, like you said, the niche markets, the ability to do a farmer market, farmer's market style thing. Uh, we just really hope that maybe we could find a way to compromise and include people's choice and freedom. On an ending note, as we all talk about beef, may we all have a steak tomorrow that is locally raised, paired with a Nebraska wine and your choice of side vegetables from your own local grocery store, farmer's market, or your own garden, because you do have the choice to raise your own animals and your own vegetables. That's all we got. Here, here. Thanks a lot, Brent. I think that was uh, very well said, and uh, I appreciate your input. Um, let's uh, move to Paula now and get her uh, uh, perspective um, from uh, the producer angle. Paula? Well, hi. Um... I'm Paula Peterson, and I will apologize in advance if you can hear the uh, truck behind us. Uh, the snow kind has got us a little bit behind. Uh, my husband and I have been married for 34 years, and we farm together outside of Waverly. We are a cow calf operation, as well as uh, we do do row crop, we just raise corn and soybeans. We run about 150 head of cattle um, each year. So we run about that many calves. Um, this last year has been a real challenge as far as knowing where we could go with our the animals that don't necessarily go to the cell barn. 
we normally do have a few that we take to our local producer. And like you said, they're out to 2022. Um, we're on a waiting list for any calves that we run into problems with that may need to go to the um, uh, butcher shop. Um, we had a cow this spring that we normally would have, um, she went down from the pen herd and there was absolutely no place we could get in. Uh, we're on a, we were on a three page waiting list for a cancellation at the two places. Paula. Um, we had um, some calves that um, we normally would have kept to butcher, but there's no place to take them. And so we ended up taking them to the sale barn and took a, about a 50 cents per pound dog. And that's my story. Thanks, Paula. Um, we appreciate that. And we know that your uh, experience and, and I think it's a testament to uh, how busy it is for both the producers and the processors that uh, we're zooming in from the cab truck there. But we appreciate your making the effort to join us. And, and we know that your experience has been a pretty common one as far as some of the frustration of the past year. Um, and, uh, and finally, we'll move uh, over to Brian and um, kind of get his experience from, you know, the procurement Thank you, Nathan. I, I really appreciate being able to, to participate on this panel. I've already uh, gleaned some good insights uh, from the other panelists, and I'm, I'm excited to move uh, forward into questions and hear what kind of stuff uh, the other people on the, <clears throat> on the call have related to, uh, certainly related to the bills that are uh, the bill uh, that is in the state legislature right now, but also uh, some of the other issues facing our industry. So uh, good evening, everybody. Like Nathan said, I, I'm with Metropolitan Community College. I'm a, I'm a chef really by training. Uh, and I work uh, at the culinary school in Omaha. And uh, Nathan asked me to share some perspective about uh, trends in the restaurant industry and how that might be relevant to this conversation. And so uh, I, I spent some time uh, doing some research that uh, changed my knee-jerk reaction, uh, and I'll, I'll share it with you and, and see if uh, the same thing happens. So every year from 2010 to 2015, a survey produced by the National Restaurant Association where they interview chefs and restaurateurs around the country, uh, each year, uh, as I said, from 2010 to 2015, there were uh, the number one position on the forecasted trend for the following year was an increased presence of local and naturally produced meat and seafood on menus. So that's number one, right? But from 2016 till today, that as a trend for restaurant menus and packaged food items, right? So they, this covers both of those categories. It doesn't cover grocery. We'll talk about that in a minute. But from 16 to 21, so the next six years, because 2021 just came out, uh, only one year in those next six was it listed in the top five. Uh, and for five of the six, it wasn't in the top 20. So I'm telling you that nationally, restaurants and packaged food producers are decreasing their care to support local sustainably produced uh, meat and seafood items or at least uh, in the response to the survey, that it's no longer the hottest new thing. So I have, I have two rebuttals to my own facts here. One is that uh, it is durable now, right? So it's no longer a fad level trend. It's now something that is an expectation of uh, restaurant and packaged foods that people would use naturally, uh, sorry, local and sustainably produced meat and seafood items. Uh, in their restaurant menus or their packaged foods, uh, that it's just become an expectation. Uh, the other might be 
or could also be that it just hasn't really landed here in the middle of the country where most of these things uh, are produced. Certainly when we're talking about uh, beef and pork, uh, we produce a great majority of those uh, uh, products here uh, in the Midwest and they're not elsewhere. So that piece uh, is real. I have found that trend, right? So I, I read and care and teach these trends every year. Uh, I have found the lag between what uh, appears in the national uh, surveys and what appears on our menus and our uh, grocery store shelves uh, to be three or four years behind that national average. So the fact that it disappeared from the top 10 and 15 doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, a bad sign, but it is something real to care about. So there's one piece of, of what I wanted to talk about. My, my uh, other piece of research that's durable here is the, the market share on the grocery store shelf. So since 2010, when they started uh, tracking, so the National uh, Grocery and Retail Association started tracking the uh, food miles of protein items in major retail chain. So only the top 20, uh, which skews it towards uh, national product or large scale producers anyway. But that number uh, has pivoted towards the local and sustainably produced meat and seafood items uh, almost a thousand fold. So that number is bombastic because we started really little in 2010. Uh, but the fact that uh, it is starting to take cooler space from uh, conventional producers in top 20 grocery and retail chains is huge. Uh, and so uh, this does not get covered uh, in any way by the bill that's sitting uh, in front of the legislature right now, but it should support the idea that customers, consumers, purchasers are starting to move their dollars towards uh, smaller producers, local producers, people that they know, or at least could connect with in a meaningful way uh, in big numbers. So uh, the thousand fold move uh, in the top 20 uh, was worth almost $100 million uh, nationwide just last year. So I mean, that's $100 million of uh, meat and pork and poultry uh, I suppose it probably includes uh, lamb and goats as well, but uh, I can't imagine that's a pretty big number anyway, uh, nationwide. But that's a, uh, an important figure for us because it means that this might just be step one, right? That finding a way that you can sell to your neighbor, your friend, your community, uh, but they can't resale is, is good, but uh, it's not gonna make long-term economic impact if there isn't a more viable market, meaning a market where you don't have to cultivate the relationship with the end user before the animal is uh, slaughtered, right? I, I get it, and it's an important part of what's happening right now uh, in the proposed legislation, but that won't change. Uh, it won't be a big enough impact uh, to, to actually make a dent in the way that our food system works. To any one producer, it could have a huge impact, but if the goal is to level up between conventional producers uh, and smaller scale producers that bring lots and lots of benefits to the uh, marketplace, we're gonna have to do more in that case. So the benefits to the marketplace. So from a restaurant perspective, I also worked on a few uh, benefits and drawbacks of uh, local meat production. So or local meat purchasing. There, there's a good long list of the benefits, uh, not least of which is competitive advantage in the marketplace, right? A restaurant that can name their producer and create a relationship between the guest at the table uh, and the producer that raised their chicken, beef, pork, whatever, uh, fish uh, gets included on that list too. Um, you get a premium for it. And so that's a benefit uh, to both the producer who needs to charge a premium to the, uh, well, to the processing facility and then to the restaurant ultimately, but that will be uh, passed on ultimately to the restaurant patron uh, in a way that would hopefully then flow back directly uh, up that supply chain or down that supply chain, however you look at it. So that premium 
uh, still exists. Uh, it's very durable. Uh, national nationwide menu research uh, indicates that you can get an almost 25% premium uh, for naming the farm or locale of a product on a given menu item. Uh, if you know that when you're talking to a restaurant about selling them your product and your products 10% more expensive, heck, even if it's 25% more expensive, uh, they're going to recoup that and some uh, because they can put your name or your uh, farm's name on the menu and that garners a 25% premium, uh, which I certainly pay. Right? That when I uh, see that a place has uh, cultivated that relationship and found somebody that cares for their product as much as they care for their cookery. Right? I mean, again, I care about it mostly from the chef perspective. I care about what happens from the back door to the plate uh, as much as anything else. But before the back door, uh, to be able to prove that those things have been done well uh, is something that is worth selling uh, and does, again, garner almost a 25% premium. Uh, again, in nationwide surveys, which will skew towards uh, larger restaurants and larger markets, but uh, it's the truth uh, around the board. But there's some real drawbacks. Uh, I know that there are people on this uh, meeting that have heard me say some of these things before, but I'll say them again. Uh, a restaurant loses money every time a different person sends them a bill or a different truck shows up at their back door. It's just the truth of the economy of scale that until we can get product into broadline distributors, it's gonna continue to be more expensive to do business with five guys to bring you stuff than with one guy to bring you stuff. That's just a, a, a real uh, a reality of doing business is that the five checks I got to write to somebody that's bringing me chickens, then pork, then beef, then fish, then something else, uh, that all costs me more money, even if the products uh, are the same amount. And so that's a real drawback of the local meat production scene uh, for restaurants. It's even worse for grocery, right? Grocery, uh, certainly the, the big time grocery people uh, that are buying through uh, national and international suppliers uh, are writing one check for most of their food that they put on the shelf. Uh, to do that again for a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars uh, is not worth it to them economically. So the fight isn't to get onto the shelf at hy in my opinion. The fight is to get on the shelf at Nash Finch or Pegler Cisco. And then it becomes an easy decision for the people that are, are making the buy on the other side of that. So again, uh, those are separate issues from what's happening with the, the legislation that's uh, sitting in front of us, which I understand, but I, I support this legislation because it starts moving in this right direction uh, and start, can, uh, start bringing that stuff to bear. Um, the other drawback, and I, I think that this is real and something uh, worth addressing, uh, or that the, the bill itself, uh, as it exists, can help alleviate, is that there is still a real uh, opposition to small production from a safety perspective. I, I don't agree that it's reality, uh, but there is certainly in urban markets a fear of the little being uh, roughshod sloppy, uh, fly by the seat of the pants. Giving it legislation and regulation helps cover that in an effective way. So uh, th that would be valuable. That would be valuable. Um, there's a question somebody just put in the chat that I'll totally answer, but I'll wait until it's really time for that. But um, So those are the two biggest uh, drawbacks, or at least the ones that I think are worth uh, floating out to this community. There are way more benefits and there are more drawbacks uh, that need to be addressed, right? Uh, in all cases, they can get addressed. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not we got the, the fortitude uh, to bring our resources to bear to address them effectively. So. That's all I've got, and uh, I think I'm the last panelist, so I think that means we're ready for questions. Is that true, Nathan? That's right, and thanks, Brian. That's, again, Absolutely. Real, really informative. Um, everybody's, uh, I've appreciated what everybody's said so far, and it's great to get these different perspectives and a lot of good information. Um, and uh, to that, to your point about, uh, you know, getting distribution lined up and, uh, 
and kind of getting those economies of scale in line. You know, I, I think Chad Christensen, uh, a producer here in the state who may be on this call, sent me an article the other day about different ways that, you know, these either processors or farmers can band together in distribution. Um, there are some farmers uh, banding together to get mobile processing units. Um, and to the extent that uh, there can be that kind of cooperation, you might uh, be able to pursue some of that efficiency. Um, I think the safety question or the safety concern um, is a real one. And I wanna maybe kick that back to Senator Brandt real quickly. Um, Brian had mentioned that uh, there, one thing that can be uh, effective in laying those kind of concerns or fears is to put some definition legal boundary around it. And um, here in this bill, I know there are some people who have voiced concerns about custom exempt processing. Um, maybe some folks who haven't used it personally or aren't as familiar with it. And uh, if you could speak to Senator Brandt, um, some of those concerns and, and the ways in which this bill might seek to account for those. Um, on the food safety issue, this bill doesn't really address the food safety issue. And because what basically what the bill says is the people that are buying the livestock are owners of the livestock. Now, if I were to do this, I would take all of my livestock to Pickerel or the dealer locker and have it processed. The problem is, is that those locations today, they're a year out. But under this bill, uh, you could also do it yourself as long as that informed and you have, they have to be an informed consumer uh, that is a herd share owner would know that. And uh, it's just like uh, Brian was talking about, there are a lot of people that want it slaughtered on the farm. They, they, these are sort of the same people that want the raw milk or they want the eggs and uh, they, they're all right with that. Um, we did put into the bill that people that use this program have to report who's buying the herd shares once a year to the Department of Ag and how much livestock that they slaughtered. Uh, I see in the chat room, there was a question on, on, on that. Um, it's sort of a self-reporting deal. The state doesn't have any inspectors on that. It would be nice if Nebraska had a state inspection program so that custom exempt facilities in the state of Nebraska could get state inspection and you could sell product intrastate inside the state of Nebraska, just like the feds, because all the all the state all the state regulations are nationally, they have to equal or exceed the federal regulations. And yet you are not allowed to sell interstate and cross the state line unless we have a cooperative agreement with other with other states that have state meat inspection. And I'm not gonna go into that. So um, it could be a concern. Uh, I can just tell you well, Wyoming's experience and uh, they have not had any issues over there. Uh, we do know when the COVID hit, um, and this is part of my rationale for bringing this, in Northern Iowa and Southern Minnesota, they euthanized 40,000 fat hogs, threw them, in a, threw them in a hole. There wasn't enough trucks uh, to take them to rendering. Uh, what a waste. In my area, there was a producer uh, just south of Lincoln here. He had 400 hogs. He went door to door and knocked on doors and basically told them, if you can, if you can kill a deer, if you can kill a hog. And he sold 400 head of hogs that way because he had no, no place to go with those hogs. And, and what happened is these uh, people in these towns bought five or six hogs and they came back for some more. Um, so yeah, herd share is not, uh, not the answer that state inspection is going to be, but it's going to take Nebraska a little while to get to state inspection. Senator Brewer has a bill. I do not have the bill number to have the State Department of Agriculture come up with a program in the next year for state meat inspection and report to the legislature. What comes out of that, I do not know. Uh, thank you, Senator Rand. Um, so it sounds like the boundaries are less on, it's not that uh, there's going to be an inspector coming into these exchanges, but more that it's going to be a situation where uh, it's going to be a limited sort of exchange and there's not going to be resale and it's uh, exactly. there's going to be a label that, uh, that to that effect. In fact, if I had to guess, I would say probably more than 50%. If I had to guess, and I'm just guessing maybe 75%, 
of this livestock would still go through a locker plant somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Um, great. And and I want to encourage anybody who has questions to, uh, we won't be doing them by audio, but to enter them into the chat and we can uh, try to get uh, as many as we are able in the time that we have left. Um, and Brian, if you want to go for that question that you noticed earlier, I think you can uh, feel free. Uh, absolutely. So I'm, I'm reading the one uh, that's how can efficiencies in, in grocery restaurant institutional organization be found to avoid broadline distributors. Uh, th there certainly is uh, a way. Uh, it takes an, an enormous amount of skill from the participants, right? That uh, one of the other drawbacks that I didn't mention of buying local uh, on the meat side is that it frequently comes with more product than you want, right? That in order to buy local pork, sometimes you're buying half a local pig uh, rather than uh, just what you would menu normally. That's okay. And I, I think it's a good uh, pressure to put on operators uh, if we're just talking about restaurants, but uh, certainly at home too. Uh, it's good to put pressure on the cook uh, to learn how to cook a little more from the rooter to the tutor, as they would say, uh, which I, I'm in for. Uh, but that is inefficient, right? The, from a menu perspective, right? It means that you're putting four dishes on your menu rather than one. It means you're changing your menu. It's you're changing your point of sale system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in order to be good at that amount of change, you have to be super highly skilled. And that narrows the field. Uh, and I'm saying that if this is really, go uh, yes, there will be people that become that good at this stuff. But if it's really gonna have an impact, we have to change some more fundamentals. So everybody doesn't have to become an expert in order for the local meat system to work. Because if everybody has to do two things, become an expert at whole hog cookery and know a hog producer. If that's what we're counting on in order for local to have an impact, you're talking about changing uh, hundreds of hours of people's uh, month uh, in, in the restaurant world. And they can't, they can't give that up. Uh, and so there's the thing is that what, where we need to call for it, and uh, this is a, a long-standing debate in the game, uh, and uh, one I've uh, been on both sides of, and I can still happily argue both sides of it. Uh, but I, I think the game is plug into the conventional rather than try to rebuild the whole thing. Is that if we want to have more local hogs consumed in local markets, then we need to find the way in which hogs are already getting consumed in local markets and take over right at that point, right? That if what we try to do is rebuild the entire supply chain in order to change the consumer's uh, last minute decision between which pork chop do they buy, you're talking about rebuilding the entirety of our state's economy. If we just sell pigs to, uh, not sell pigs, sell pork, to into the system that's already supplying 95% uh, of the pigs, of the pork that gets uh, eaten in the state, well, then you can have an impact. But if we're gonna count on everybody to become a believer, meet a hog farmer and uh, learn how to cook, uh, you know, 15 different cuts of pork, you, we're not gonna get there. I mean, you're talking about uh, changing uh, way more then anybody's gonna sign up for it. Then lots of people are gonna sign up for it. I'm not saying there won't be people that sign up for it. Of course there will. But if the, if the goal is to make a dent into how much commodity pork uh, we buy, and I, nobody has expressed that as the goal, I think that's a good goal. Uh, but if that is a goal, right? Because I think that does mean more money in the pocket of the little producer of the individual, right? That when you can cut out 10 middlemen in favor of three middlemen rather than zero, right? If the goal is get rid of all the middlemen, well then the producer and the consumer have a ton of work to do. But if you can keep a few middlemen in there, well then, you know, one, right? So if, if in my model, I would see the producer, the processor, the salesperson, the end user, restaurant, grocery store, or consumer, right? Whoever that is. 
which isn't really that different than what's happening now. But if, we, if we've got to uh, take on a world where the producer and the consumer need to have nobody in between them, uh, I, I don't know, you're erasing uh, 1,500 years of uh, food service uh, uh, growth and development, right? That somebody grew the grain, somebody else milled it, somebody else bought it and turned it into bread, somebody else made that a sandwich, and then somebody sold that in a cart on the streets of Rome 2,500 years ago. Like, there's been middlemen in the game increasing the, our access to food the whole time. And I think that's a critical thing to embrace, not to stand against. That's my sign of I'm shutting up. Thanks, Brian. Um, I think, so I'm going through the questions here. I think we've answered Debs about tracking, um, tracking the number who are slaughtered. Um, hey, Nathan, Brent, Brent's waving his hand over there. He's got something to say. Brent needs to unmute. Yeah, go on ahead, Brent. You can, uh, you can add your piece. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, this is my first time ever doing Zoom, so sorry. I did see a question that somebody had asked about how to regulate that it stays to just the 10 head per producer. And coming from experience, I don't, I don't like regulation personally. I mean, nobody does. But like I said earlier, it is a good compromise. When a, a producer brings an animal to us for slaughter, they have to sign a paper from the government that says, is it over 30 months of age or under 30 months of age for mad cow disease? And then is it able to walk in? Is it fit for human consumption? The producer of that, or the, the producer itself, signs all that to say, yes, they assume the responsibility that they're lying, that you know they'll do the punishment, and it is under 30 months. I think since we're regulated on making them sign that before killing it, that that would be a good way. Nobody really checks that periodically once or twice a year when an inspector comes through they'll look at that um, they do just flip through it make sure we're doing it but if you want to really regulate that we're only doing 10 head per producer you could put in regulation that says okay if you break this you're, you're shut down and you get a slap on the wrist but um, i did see that question and there's my two cents thanks brent um and then also if we could uh, Senator Brand, if you have anything to add to that, and then I'd like to go back to this uh, question here um, from Chloe Daigle. Um, and she asks, do we even need the herd share language in the statute? Can an LLC structure be created that would allow unlimited processing within uh, exempt facilities? So uh, if, if you could, if you have anything to add to the question about how you document the, you know, the I, I, I guess uh, Brent knows this as well as anybody is that right now all the custom exempt facilities in Nebraska are federally inspected. But yes. in, in talking to some of my uh, talking to some of these guys, the inspectors usually don't come around till there's a complaint. I mean, they may not be there for five years. They follow the federal rules. Uh, we had a hearing in Grand Island this last summer where the director of SS, FSIS flew into for a hearing on state meat inspection in Nebraska. And he as good as admitted they don't like these little plants. They would just as soon have the states inspect them. They want to inspect the Tysons and JBS and the Smithfields of the world uh, because what happens at a, at a uh, locker plant like Brent's in, in one of our small towns in Nebraska, I don't know what your capacity is, Brent, but I would guess maybe 10 steers or 20 eight steers. Eight whopping head a week. Yep. Yeah, eight head a week. Well, if he's, in a, you're not federally inspected, are you? I mean, no, I, I got to say, I used to work at Custom Pack in Hastings where we were. Right. And the inspector at Hastings was also our inspector. Yeah. And I did know him and I would. I would actually call him annually to get him to come inspect us because it was kind of a pain for him, but right. I, I tried right. to fly by the rules. So right. Right. Yes, are, it was a pain. Are, you're not, you're not selling, uh, you're not federally inspected. No. And here's the difference folks. If you are a federally inspected meat plant, then Brent could sell parts of that beef. He could just sell you the T-bones or the ground beef or whatever, but because he's custom exempt, I, the farmer, am bringing that steer in there 
And as far as Brent can go, is he processes a half or a quarter for whoever I say that half or that quarter goes to. And going back to what Brian was saying, the problem becomes for that housewife to buy a half a steer from me is gonna cost her $750. And then the last whole steer we had processed, half of that would cost 350. So you're asking a consumer to pony up 1100 bucks and they better have a freezer and then they gotta then they gotta tell them how to cut it up. And then you're gonna find out that they don't like certain cuts. Because I, I know in our family there's certain things that always remain in the freezer, but uh, you run out of steak and you always have a lot of roasts left. I mean, that's just sort of how how our household goes. Whereas at least with this herd share model, it's it's sort of a poor man's way of of getting around the rules. I I'll be honest, that's really what Wyoming did. And it really echoes the work ethos of rural America. It's like, don't tell us what to do. We can do this just fine. And we've been doing it for 150 years without you. Um, and I do think there is a way to include everybody on this. But um, I'm, I'm just more excited to bring it to the legislature just to have the discussion. And I hope it makes it to the floor. I, I think we, we have a pretty good shot. But once it gets to the floor, it's got to make it all the way through. I mean, there's a there's a lot of hurdles here, folks, uh, to get this across the finish line. I think that uh, if I could jump in, this has been so informative. Thank you all so much. Uh, Debbie had a good question about how it's tracked. And within the bill, it's required that if you are taking advantage of the personal exemption and cutting on the farm, you need to report that to the Department of Agriculture. So you need to sign up as being kind of register as someone who's going to do that. And every year you need to report how many that you're actually going to, to, to do on the farm. And you need to have the names of the people that you sold that to. So that's one way we can put a tracking system in there. The state of Vermont's done a really good job of keeping this uh, regulated. It's sort of one end of the extreme. You got Vermont and you got Wyoming. And those are the two statutes that we were able to look at the most often when, uh, when Senator Brandt was developing this. And, and so that's one thing we wanted to put in there to make sure that that's tracked and to make sure that we can hold people accountable at the end of the day. And that speaks to safety a bit too. Vermont also required some good language about really notifying the purchaser or the consumer, hey, this isn't state inspected, it's not federally inspected, um, it's custom or I'm doing it on the farm. You gotta let people know. Uh, and so a lot of that is just being an educated food consumer, just like any other cottage food, really. If you're not making jam at home, I have to do something similar. It's the same principle. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and I think, well, it looks like we're just kind of running up against our, our, our end time here. So uh, I think we'll conclude to uh, any concluding thoughts from... Well, hold on, Nathan, if it's all right. I feel like this is such a good group. And uh, Senator Brandt mentioned that it's gonna be an uphill battle. We have a good chance, but in order to get there, this is the group of people we need to support it. Um, there's a lot of familiar faces on here and you guys really know your stuff. And so if you're on the fence about this bill or if you're not sure if it's a match or you don't know if you understand it fully, please speak up. I'm willing to, to stay on a little bit longer. I don't know if everybody else is or if you need to drop off, but if there's a question in the back of your mind, uh, you can just type that in or you can um, also just send us a note. We'd be glad to address it because we're really gonna need your support to move it. Um, the Ag Committee always likes to hear from regular people and people who are really on the ground experiencing this. Um, and I think, can I ask a question about uh, the, the bill's movement a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I don't know the workings of the legislature, right? I mean, I, I mean, I've been on the tour with my kids when we go, but uh, that's about the level of my understanding. Like, what's the way to activate, you know, who do I call? Like, do I call the my, you know, my senator from my district uh, and say, hey, I support this. Do I write a letter that goes somewhere? What do I, you know, how do I do it? If, if I could comment on that. And when I speak to a lot of my groups and I speak to a lot of different groups about different things, what I tell people, and this is Tom Brandt, every senator is a little bit different, uh, but I get over a hundred emails a day. Those aren't necessarily all constituents. Uh, they could be from across the state. They could be from groups. Uh, I get the newspaper online. So, I mean, it's a variety of things. Me personally, the most effective thing is to email me directly and put your name and address on there. And, and the reason I say that 
is I get a lot of people that just put their name on there. Um, and it's just like today, landlord tenant law, uh, we got, I got probably 150 emails, probably 130 of them were from Omaha. Well, that's great, but that you aren't my constituent, but the one or two that were from Deschler or Hebron, I get back to them. Yep. That, that matters to a Senator. If you're from their district, don't think it doesn't. And so if they have enough people worried about a bill and uh, you have enough people from your district talking to that Senator, it is effective. And, and I would say, uh, Jonathan Laddick uh, helped us put this together. Uh, Center for Rural Affairs is going to run point on recruiting uh, people to support this. Uh, so there's, there's another resource for you. Um, if you go to nebraskalegislature.gov, uh, you can find out who your senator is and what their email is. Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, there's the apologies to my senator that you just told me how to do that. <laughs> There's, a, there's no one better to hear that from than the Senator himself. To give you kind of a snapshot of what we're dealing with is uh, there, um, you can testify at the hearing and a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And so you can either submit a letter to get it out of committee at, at the hearing, or you can go ahead and drop that off between 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. that day. And the reason that's important to us, and if anybody is supportive of this, if you could do that, it'd be a big help, is because then it's on the committee statement. So the Senator mentioned getting it out of committee is our first big hurdle, but then it goes to the floor. And a lot of senators who aren't on ad committee aren't willing to know a lot about the bill, but they do have this piece of paper called the committee statement. And it'll say who supported this bill and it'll say who opposed this bill. And so if we can get on the committee statement and we could say, boy, look at this, all these groups supported it, all these farm groups, all these processors, all these producers, all these, these, these restaurateurs, all these people involved in local foods, they'll see that all those people supported it right away. And that's how we can show them that it's an important bill. If you just email your, your testimony to the committee or just go ahead and click on the bill to submit, they'll, they'll read it as you being supportive in the committee, but it's not going to be on the committee statement. It's not gonna be on the record of that. And so if there's anybody who thinks that this is important and they'd like to help us move forward, boy, going to the hearing that day and weighing in is one way to do it. Dropping it off that morning is one way to do it. And then when it gets to the floor, then we're thinking about how we get to those individual senators like Mr. Grant mentioned. And, and I'm just going to throw in real quick here. For those of you that have never witnessed a hearing, if you go to that same website, uh, we're in all day hearings. So tomorrow, uh, there'll be natural resources, judiciary, uh, HHS, and two other committees. You can click on those and live stream and see how that works, see how people testify. Because if you want to testify, uh, depending on the committee, you probably can give a five minute statement. And a, a, all committee hearings run the same way. The Senator I get up front, I introduce the bill for five or 10 minutes, and then we ask for proponents. So people that support the bill can go up there and they can talk for up to five minutes and then the senators may or may not ask questions. And after the proponents, we go to opponents. And then after the opponents, we go to the neutral. And the neutral could be somebody that really has a concern about the bill, but they aren't really against the bill. So they testify in the neutral capacity, and then the senator closes. Um, so because this is going to the Ag Committee, I'm, I would think we'll probably have a five-minute testimony. If there's a lot of people, we'll cut it back to three minutes. Uh, but the Ag Committee doesn't have a lot of bills this year, so they'll have time to hear this. So uh, that's all I've got on that. I see Brent was raising his hand. Brent, just start talking. That's how this works. <laughs> okay. Um, so we had mentioned earlier in conversation that it's good to get groups of people together because it catches attention that, you know, there is more than just a few people interested. Is there other states besides Wyoming that's pushing for this maybe? Yes. Uh, we know Texas and I think Arkansas, uh, Jonathan, who else was there? There was like three or four that are, are at the same stage we're at. Oh, Colorado right now, they're, they're considering a bill too, and they're all in their infancy. And so what we're trying to do in Wyoming is we're going to have testimony from the representative who actually uh, 
ran the bill there. He did a great job. Tyler Lindholm, uh, Senator, mentioned him early on. So we're getting him, and then we're also going to get some statements on record from their Department of Agriculture, where they're saying, hey, we know this is legal. We support it. We're going forward. Having it there and to look at it and to see a state that really excelled and did it well, we think it's going to bode very well. But there is no replacement, I promise you guys, there's no replacement from showing a committee that individuals, I'm sorry, I have a four-year-old back there. Those aren't my hogs in the house. It's a, it's a toddler. Uh, there's no replacement for showing that that individual Nebraskans uh, support this, and that's really what we need. Jonathan Al Davis here. I just wanted to. You did a great job presenting about the testimony. Um, the, they've gotten some new kind of different rules this year, and that you can you can send a letter to the you have to send it to the ag committee email address, which is posted on the website, and it has to be by noon the day before the hearing, or it won't be included. I think it's important that people know that. And I think there may be some other things that are associated with that. But, And then there is also the online piece that can be filled out. It's 300 words. Um, but I don't think that becomes part of the record. I think that's just available to staff. So I would encourage them to either show up that morning. And if, if they do that, if they're not going to testify, they have to show up with the 12 copies to give to the committee clerk between 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning. So they've put some sort of restrictive rules in place for this new approach. Yeah, that's right. And there's uh, that's two senators, one former and one current. So they're, uh, they're the ones to look at. And I think, Mark, that answers your question well. But if not, um, send a note and we'll try to clarify it. There was a question early on about who's opposed to this bill. And the answer is not many. I think that when we um, when we talk about it with individuals, uh, we get a really favorable reception. Most of the time, it says something along the lines of, "This is a no-brainer. We support it. We wish this would have happened earlier." Uh, some people have some questions about uh, about uh, the food safety element of that, which we've kind of addressed. You know, I always think and Senator Brandt knows this more than anyone on the call, but when you're bringing your cattle to Smithfield, that is blowing by, and that is how it's inspected. Your cow's probably going to be mixed up with some other ones, and that's where to get your burger. That's no picnic out there, right? That's no carrot on a food safety. And so we know that small businesses regulate themselves. We know that the processor down the road for you and your community is going to have his reputation on the line or her reputation on the line. And that's what we think is important to remember. You know, I'm a producer myself. So I sell most of my hogs custom exempt. And, uh, there's no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, half a hog every time, custom exempt. And uh, so if I'm selling just a package of pork chops, custom exempt, it's no different. It's the same level of regulation and I've never had a complaint. There is a, there's a question, would Big Ag support this? We asked the guys in Wyoming, they said they pretty much ignored them. Um, it, this, this really, uh, their opinion was it really didn't affect Big Ag and Big Ag really didn't care about it at this point. I don't know in Nebraska what's going to happen. It'll be interesting to see uh, where the opposition comes from. And I, uh, that's a, those are some good questions there. I want to go way back to Chloe's because it was so important. And that's the second question we get more most often is why is this actually necessary? Uh, so basically when, when I sell custom exempt, let's say it's a steer that I have, uh, the lowest amount I do is by a quarter. And that's still going to cost about 750 bucks. Um, sometimes you can get the processing in for that. And it's going to take up a big amount of freezer space. Um, most people don't have that freezer space. And most people, uh, frankly, just can't afford that. And so what we want to do is break that level of ownership down to a more manageable scale. Um, we want to be able to have somebody... Ms. Senator Brandt mentioned uh, maybe a working mother who wants to just buy some hamburger because she knows the stuff you get at Walmart isn't that good. Uh, we want to make this accessible to them. So yes, you could start an LLC in custom exempt, but you can't sell it under custom exempt. I can only sell by the half because and I can only sell it when it's on the hoof or by the quarter. I can't sell individual cuts custom exempt. So yes, you could start an LLC in custom exempt, but still you can only sell big portions. You can't sell it by the half. What we're doing here is we're redefining ownership. We're making ownership something accessible to more people. 
that helps the consumer in a really big way. That means more people can purchase local meats and that is a big help for the producer. That means I can access more customers and have a more thriving customer base. And that's really why this is going to be needed. Uh, we don't feel like it contravenes federal law even a little bit. We feel like federal law does open the door for that, but we do know the state has a role in defining that ownership. And we do know that in order to qualify for federal law, there needs to be certain things. One, uh, Senator Brandt mentioned that there's going to need to be that bill of sale. That bill of sale is going to have the requirements that you need to qualify for federal law under 623 of the Federal Meat Inspection Act. And two, you're going to have to have the herd share contract. That herd share contract is what shows that level of ownership. So these two things together are just your roadmap for following federal law and getting custom exempt applying to more people. And that's what we're going for here. And we really do think that's a home run. So, And if possible, I'd like to give some uh, firsthand uh, insight. Senator Brandt had mentioned that uh, his freezer is always low on steaks. You guys wouldn't believe, honestly, how many uh, people do buy a quarter or half a beef. And they say, throw the steaks in a hamburger. It's, it's gut-wrenching. You got this beautiful thing. I mean, what I do for a living is make beautiful food for a plate. And I'm grinding it up into mush. But their kids eat hamburger. And they are putting a big chunk of cash down all at one time. And they like steak. They'll buy a steak for their birthday or whatever the occasion is later. But they're putting a bunch of money down. And they got to have something their kids will eat. So Senator Brandt could buy more steak. I don't think you're having any kids right now that don't like eating that right now. And, and then the, the moms at home, they could get more of their hamburger. And what's, what's sort of unique that most people don't realize, and somebody made a comment about a deer, you can shoot a deer, drag it through the woods, gut it, hang it on a tree, and everybody eats it. They think this is the greatest thing in the world. I try and avoid it. The second thing is, uh, my wife gets on me because I don't eat fish. You can go to the Missouri River, catch a fish, and take it into Brian's restaurant in Omaha and serve it legally. Because fish is FDA inspected. And if you can say, I'm, I better stop there before I get into trouble. <laughs> and the, the last thing is chickens in the state of Nebraska, or not the state, but nationally, it used to be 20,000. I don't know if it's still 20,000 head, but you could kill 20,000 broilers. And I think it might be a thousand now on your farm and sell them any way you want to. And yet when we get to the marrowed animals, the pork, the beef, um, goat and sheep, uh, we got a whole different different set of rules. And Brad is right. Uh, when you read The Jungle, which I would ask everybody to go back and read, what a great book. That's why we've got the laws we've got today. So that's my last two cents here. Yeah, and I'll just add to some of the things that were just mentioned. and. The legality that Paul Kicker, the director of SI, FSIS, the Federal Inspection Service, was at that hearing at Grand Island, and this question was asked about Wyoming's law, and uh, he did confirm there that this uh, there's no contravention here between this kind of law and federal law. Um, and uh, also to Mark Welsh's question there in the chat, uh, you can submit your letter before, as long as it's before noon the day previous to the hearing you are free to uh, email it. Um, uh, that being said, of course, the best thing to do, if you can, is to hand it in in person. Um, now, I'm just looking at seeing if there's any final questions we haven't addressed um, here in the chat. Um, yeah, it looks like we maybe have reached the end of our questions and uh, can kind of go to any concluding thoughts. Uh, Senator Brand, if you have any Final words, we can start with you. I think this is great. Uh, this really shows their support across the state, uh, across a wide variety of consumers and producers. And, um, you know, let's flesh this thing out and see if Nebraska can be a leader. Uh, what I've found since I've been in the legislature, typically Nebraska doesn't get on board till we're the 48th, 49th, or 50th state to do something. By God, you know, let's be the second, third, or fourth state to, to lead the way on something once. We are an egg powerhouse um, and it's reflected in the bills that I've got. Not only herd share, uh, we also are doing farm to school. And that's the one that says that our school systems ought to be buying food from Nebraska producers, whether it's meat or fruits and vegetables. Cause it's insane that our school system supported by our property tax dollars are spending that money out of state when we've got that high quality food right here. And with that, I will rest um, and uh, 
Thank you for having me tonight, and I am going mute. Thanks very much, Senator. We appreciate your contribution uh, very much. Uh, Bren, if you have just a few short final words that uh, you'd like to share, any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to just tell everybody my, my honest opinion is, like I said, um, and I didn't catch her name, the, the producer that was on the phone earlier that was hauling her cattle, she couldn't get her beef in for a whole year. We're very busy. I'm not doing this for my own personal gain to try to push these kind of ideas, but it's all about choice. It's all about what you as a person want to have on your plate with your own family. And uh, where we lose the ability to make that choice, it's it should make you scratch your head a little bit and think, how do we get there? And if, like Senator Brandt said, we could be one of the first states to go with this, uh, it could avalanche into something prosperous and, and beneficial to everybody. And that's all I have. Thanks, Brent. We appreciate your time as well. And we would kick it over to Paula too, but I think uh, she probably had to get those calves unloaded uh, during this call. So Brian, if you have any concluding words. I'm honored to be last uh, in this conversation, but uh, it, it's been uh, interesting to say the least, and I'm, I'm honored to have been able to participate. And uh, I hope what happens is that we continue this vibrancy around this issue because uh, there is more to do, but I think if, if this is uh, the next step to take, I'm excited that we take it, and I think it will uh, start to change the landscape in a, a positive uh, in meaningful way. And uh, I, I don't know if I put it in the chat or not, but they were talking about, you know, one family getting the ground beef and somebody else getting the steaks, but nobody called the oxtails in that story. So I got, I mean, on the, I, I got dibs on those. <laughs> Cheers. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. May, maybe we made a connection there, Brian, between you and Brent and we can uh, work something out. <laughs> um, we appreciate everybody's participation. And I think, Brian, you're right. There's clearly a lot of interest in what this call shows is a broad base of support from kind of all angles on this issue. So uh, we appreciate everybody's time again, and we encourage you if this is, you know, whatever you are, a customer, producer, processor, an observer. Um, if this may, I is may I say something that actually uh, Brian did mention that I never even thought about that's really actually deep and important. If a customer doesn't want something from their beef or hog, like any of the organ meat, the heart, the tongue, the tail, the liver, any of these kind of things, if they don't want it, by law, legally, I have to put that in a barrel that says inedible in two languages. And in case you don't speak those languages, I, I spray a green denatrin on top because if you don't want it, I can't resell that. And it would surprise you how many people don't want the heart, tongue, tail, and liver for whatever reason. And it's amazing how many thousands of pounds of protein we throw away every year that I have no, I can't legally give it to a food pantry or I can't give it away. It has to get thrown away properly. Right, that's a good point, I think, as well. Um, and and uh, it, it's important to figure out ways to you know eliminate that waste and find ways that that can get on that dinner plates as well. Um, and uh, again, I just want to say uh, as a concluding point that uh, if you've you know found this interesting and, and like something you'd support, you can reach out to us, uh, to Jonathan or I. Our information is on uh, cfra.org. And uh, we're happy to help you craft uh, a letter or a testimony or, or connect you with your senator, or help you navigate the legislative website, again, because it's so important that uh, people make their voice heard on these issues. So thanks again for uh, your attendance and your participation, everybody. We appreciate it so much. And we will see you next time.